So uh, my name is Phil. I work for Intel, um, and I've spent like the past two years of my life doing kind of a very long, prolonged dive and catch to uh, to take uh, a, a prototype of our, our our software stack that drives the TPM2 devices, and and really turn it into just kind of the piece of plumbing and infrastructure that you know really we've needed for a long time. So um, I'm going to try and go through this pretty quick since we're over an hour behind schedule. Um, so I'll, 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 the background's only a single slide. The, the, the standards body stuff is really just gonna talk about the architecture and, and the, the component model. Uh, some of the use cases that, that were driving this whole thing, um, just like any good API should be driven by use cases. Um, and, but also really the important stuff here is this, uh, the, the third bullet or the third major bullet here, which is the, the open source community that we've kind of tried to, to form around this thing. Um, uh, the whole purpose that we've got, all the goals that we're trying to, to hit, um, who's playing uh, in, in the space uh, and who's been adopting it. Um, of course, there's alternatives just like in any healthy ecosystem. Uh, so I'm, I'm, we're well aware of those things and, and we're not gonna ignore that. Uh, and I think I'll probably end up blowing past some of the, the ending, but we'll see when we get there. Uh, so TPM 1.2 and 2.0 from, uh, the, from the perspective of, of actually the use cases, they're not very different. Uh, it's still the root of trust for measurement, still the root of trust for reporting. Uh, it's still, uh, is really designed to protect cryptographic keys uh, when they are uh, um, uh, in use. So it's keeping stuff out of main memory. We don't want people to just reach into your RAM, grab your keys, and then take them to a different system and impersonate you. Uh, if, if the key is loaded into the TPM, someone may be able to actually use it by driving the TPM if a policy is, is, is in place that allows it. However, uh, they won't be able to steal it and impersonate you on a different platform. Uh, TPM 1.2, the reason that really this is, is being replaced by 2.0 is that it's very limited in the algorithms that it supports. Uh, the RSA 1 and 2K keys, SHA 1 really is the big problem. Uh, and it doesn't, you know, so, or there was really no way to add additional algorithms to the, to the implementation. The, the, the command structures uh, for the, you know, the, the buffers that are sent and received from the TPM and 1.2 are very specific to the actual algorithms themselves. Um, there's uh, just a single hierarchy in, the, in this stuff and the, the policy itself was uh, sufficient but uh, limited. And so in 2.0, a lot of these things were addressed, right? The, the, the algorithm agility, as they call it in the, the spec, is uh, um, really the important part. Uh, it can support you know, any number of algorithms. There's uh, a set of required algorithms, uh, but it can be expanded to support things that are maybe uh, uh, specific to individual countries. So uh, you won't see a whole lot of TPMs, or at least not that I've particularly seen that will support like the SMX algorithms, uh, but it's very possible. And, and from my understanding is there are some Chinese manufacturers that are making these. Uh, but the ECC algorithms are really important for something that has such a small amount of memory. Having smaller keys is, you know, a very good thing. Um, and also, I guess the, the point here about the integrity protected in encrypted sessions is really important. So in, in 1.2, the, the use case, um, or rather the threat model, completely or ruled out the uh, defending against local threats. So if you get onto a system, you could touch the bus on the system, you could manipulate uh, the communication between the TPM and whatever was talking to it, and you know, there were a number of people that, that showed that that was very possible. Um, with TPM 2.0, uh, the, the session between an application and the TPM can be integrity protected and it can have some portions of it be encrypted. Uh, now that's not to say that this is like TLS type strength and I'm not so sure I would go sending any, uh, using this to protect like internet style communications uh, between me and a remote TPM. However, it, it's possible and I think it would be really interesting if people started looking at this uh, mechanism from, you know, from that standpoint to see about how strong we really think this is. And support for 1.2 is actually uh, being phased out very quickly. And in, in preparing for the talk, I was looking at just some websites searching for you know, different OEMs and what they're supporting. And there's a, a little reference there. I've got a, a list of these at the end. Uh, but some OEMs are actually dropping support for 1.2 in, in Linux uh, on their systems. So um, right now, I think the, the link here is to a Dell website. So Dell has on their website a statement that says that 1.2 is not supported on Linux. Oops. I don't know where I went to. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, so now just getting into the actual, the API itself. So the TCG, the TSS working group, um, 
it was a little bit stalled. And uh, not to say that when I showed up, everything was magically fixed. A lot of this stuff was actually very much close to being done. There were just some, you know, just a few things that needed to be pushed out of the way. And so the, all of these things, the, these design uh, uh, goals and such, they all predate me. This isn't, you know, my work. So the, the working group had already uh, laid out a number of these design goals, specifically uh, the separation of the API layers. So we've actually separated the transport from the actual APIs that are driven from user space. Uh, for anyone who's worked in 1.2 uh, and specifically the implementation on Linux, uh, the TCSD daemon and the tools that are run from user space are inextricably bound taking one of those tools and running it against directly against the kernel is extremely difficult and uh, nigh impossible. And it makes for uh, a very brittle system. So by separating the transport mechanism from the actual APIs, uh, we get a lot of flexibility that I think was really important. Uh, the asynchronous nature of, of uh, the commands uh, is, is another particularly important thing. A lot of programming models are very much going towards event-driven systems, and so the, the APIs are asynchronous uh, all the way top to bottom. Uh, again, the, the layered nature of this allows for uh, it does come with a certain amount of complexity, I suppose. However, the details at the different layers are exposed uh, as they're uh, in, in certain places where they're necessary, but they can be abstracted away at higher levels. Uh, similarly, we try to pick same defaults in our implementation uh, that allow or that, that don't require that the user make a bunch of decisions uh, if they don't want to. But it allows for, uh, for the decisions to be made if, if, if it's something that the, the user space wants to control or rather the application wants to control. So at the lowest layer uh, from the API, uh, that's obviously a layer above the, uh, the transport, uh, it's a very thin layer over the raw TPM2 command uh, structure. Uh, but on top of that, we, we can add bells and whistles, and we'll talk about that a bit more on this uh, in the next slide. So this is straight from one of the specs. Uh, I guess this is from the overview spec. Uh, the bottom layer here is just talking about the device driver. This isn't something that, that we actually uh, deal with, but it's to really just give a point of reference. On top of this is a resource management layer. TPM itself is very resource constrained. You can load maybe a few keys, uh, RSA keys, that is, so larger keys. You may see three that you could load at a time. Uh, and a lot like a, a CPU, you can really, uh, the, the resources are, are constrained. And so we have to switch the context effectively uh, for, uh, for different applications when they send commands. The TPM itself doesn't know uh, anything about uh, which process is talking to the TPM at any given time. It does not know where these commands come from. And so we have a, a user space mechanism or potentially a, a kernel mechanism that can load these things in and out dynamically based on its knowledge of the, 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 the connected clients that are there. Um, and the, the, the transport layer actually kind of lives in a couple different places here. We, we, we need that, of course, from the resource manager to talk down to the device driver if it's in user space. Uh, but similarly, it exists between the APIs that are driving uh, communication with the resource manager or potentially directly to the device driver. Uh, these things should be as thin as they possibly can. Uh, and so for talking directly to the device driver, it's just talking to you know, dev TPM0 or, or something similar. And so it can be actually very small. Really, you don't want to have to do crypto in this layer, though it is possible. There's nothing that says you can't. Uh, and uh, yeah, we've, one of the things that, that is actually a contribution of mine is the, uh, the dynamic loading. So we have a, a deal open API. So you can write your application in a generic way such that it could load any uh, of these, these TCTI modules if they're, they're compliant with the spec, obviously. And on top of this, there are, are three APIs that are really intended for use from user space. Uh, starting here on the left, the system API is meant to be used by expert applications, things that may be highly embedded, uh, environments where there may not be a heap, or potentially things like um, you know, firmware. So it obviously has the, the asynchronous API like I was talking about, but it's really not supposed to be doing, and it doesn't do any uh, file I.O., it doesn't do any cryptographic operations for you, uh, and, and it's uh, very much a one-to-one -one mapping with the TPM commands. Uh, the enhanced system API starts to add features that are really necessary for what we would think of as a normal user space application. Uh, it provides additional utility functions uh, that are necessary for doing things like cryptographic sessions and, and HMAC sessions. So this just keeps you from having to reach into the command buffer, do some kind of HMAC calculation uh, yourself like you would with the system API and then kind of reassembling things and sending it out. So this is really you know, what you would expect uh, for use from like a C application. 
The feature API is something we haven't implemented yet, and the spec is still being debated and, and worked on. Um, uh, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about that. And this is really just another view, just like the last one, but a little more uh, what you might see from an actual application. This is an application that's talking you know, directly to the device driver, using the TCTI mechanism for talking to that uh, driver. And you see there the, the TSS2-sys, that's the library where we have the system API implemented. Next to that was something I actually isn't, wasn't on the last uh, slide because it actually went into the spec after the, I, I took that out of the spec. Uh, but the TSS2-MU there is the type marshaling library, so I've got a, a bullet here for it. And we, this just kind of, the need for this came out just in the implementation uh, as we were, were working on it. The, 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 the commands and response buffers that go to and from the TPM are, are in network byte order. You're working in user space, you may not actually have that, that type of byte order. And so having a library to just take TPM structures that we mapped into C structures and turning them into the network byte order is actually extremely useful. Um, and then at the, you know, the, the, the top layer there is the system API. So that's just the prefix there. Um, it just is meant to be a, a generic system API call. Uh, this is a fun part of working in a standards body. You'll notice the prefix on there, TSS2 underscore sys underscore. Uh, you have people that come from a Windows programming background, they want camel case. You have people from the Unix communities, they want underscores. And hey, guess what? Everyone gets to have what they wanted. <laughs> Great. So adding something like ESIS, uh, the, the picture changes slightly, and you see the additional complexity there on account of it. Uh, our, our implementation actually builds using ESIS on top of it, uh, or rather on top of the, the system API, uh, and you'll see there the, the addition of a, a crypto library. So this is uh, to support uh, the encryption operations, the HMAC operations, hashing, um, and uh, the, this is you know, just a, a nice uh, a utility functions that you would really want to have for you know, a generic C application that's driving this. It does add additional dependencies. You have a crypto library. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about our implementation in a bit. Um, and it does a lot of the state management that, that doesn't get done in the, uh, the system API. Resource management is kind of a pain, and this was, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, some work that I, I had done in user space. And a lot of this is starting to find its way into the kernel, so there's a, a small piece of the resource management that's being done in the kernel now. So I think that's a, a good trend that I'm hoping it's going to stay up. Uh, and so the, let's see, the important stuff here, let's, let's just kind of skip over this. I don't think anyone really cares too much about that. Um, all right, so implementation and use cases. So... This was, this was not originally my work. I, I, I picked up this work after, you know, there was a, a, four people at Intel that were working on this. Um, they had kind of open sourced it in the throw it over the wall uh, open sourcing methodology, um, which you know, it meant that there was a whole lot of technical debt that was built up into this. So really, my job started out with just kind of identifying technical debt uh, figuring out, you know, what's the target audience? What do they need? What do they expect? Uh, and, you know, the, we didn't really know our audience on the first time around. So I, I've really been working to, to align this in such a way so that when people look at it, they say, okay, that's, that's stable. It looks like it's going to be reliable. It's something that I can count on being there when I need it in the future. And so I should build an application on top of it because, you know, it's not going to be a liability. It's not going to fall apart and I'm not going to have to pick up the pieces and put it back together. Um, so we've, we've picked up, a, you know, we're, we're following the semantic versioning scheme. We've done our best to model a healthy open source project, which actually ended up being really good for us because it actually means we have a healthy open source project with everything you would expect uh, in, in one. So, you know, when I picked this up, there was a single test application. It was over 8,000 lines long. Uh, we weren't building libraries. We weren't building shared objects. Everything was just getting compiled into uh, anything that was using it. So our test application had everything built into it statically. The resource management code, same thing. Our command line tools were actually, you know, the make file would clone the library uh, for, for user space and just build it directly into everything. So once we pulled all that stuff apart, we started implementing a real test harness with unit tests, with integration tests. And really this is about making adding new tests easier. So We've slowly been picking apart this 8,000 line test application, setting it into you know, individual integration tests, and then plugging all of this stuff into the continuous integration environment. So we drive everything with, with Travis CI, we build both with GCC and with Clang. Uh, we run Coverity uh, scans on everything. Uh, we collect code coverage metrics for our, uh, from all of our tests and we report this through coveralls. You know, we started with probably single digit test coverage. Uh, we've gotten it over 
uh, 80 percent uh, coverage now thanks to you know some of our collaborators that that I'll talk about in a moment uh, and really the, the the technical debt that we've been you know kind of targeting is stuff to make this easier on everyone else so making things debuggable uh, and unfortunately some things we just couldn't save so the original resource management daemon that was left behind by my predecessor uh, we just took it out back and put it out of its misery and started over uh, so we've actually got a, a, an organization up on GitHub. We have a, a bunch of repositories, and so we've put it all under a top-level organization that we call TPM2-Software. It's a very original name. Um, so the core libraries live in their own repository. The resource management daemon has been completely rewritten and taken out into its own uh, repository. We have a set of command line tools that are really uh, probably one of the more important parts of the project because it's usually most people's first experience working with the project. Uh, we've got a mailing list that's hosted on 01.org through Intel's Open Source Technology Center. Uh, we've got an IRC channel on Freenode. So if you want to get in touch, we're trying to make it as easy as we possibly can. And we've actually had a, a whole lot of success in that. So when it started, it went from a four-man team where everyone just kind of left at once. I took this whole thing over and probably spent about eight to 12 months just kind of solo trying to get it in shape so that other people were willing to to, to be associated with it. Uh, and I managed to collect a bunch of people and recruit them from inside of Intel to help me out. And we've started getting some external contributors as well. So uh, Infineon and Fraunhofer uh, have, have been really big uh, uh, help along the way. Fraunhofer SIT has actually contributed the ESIS implementation. They actually had their own implementation of the entire stack that wasn't open source. But as soon as this started looking like it was, it was going to survive, they actually took their ESIS implementation and rebased it on top of you know, our underlying bits, which was just enormous. I think that's probably the only reason why I'm actually standing here talking about the, the project like it's a success is because we needed ESIS to be successful. Uh, and we've also got uh, uh, some, some really good uh, interaction with Red Hat. So we actually have uh, on our tools project, we have uh, uh, one of our maintainers is actually a guy from Red Hat and he's phenomenal. Um, some of our earliest adopters, Facebook was one of the first uh, people to actually use this. Or, uh, and we've had patches that came in from Alibaba. Um, Suze gave me some really, really, really good code reviews on the resource management daemon and helped me catch some pretty embarrassing bugs before uh, anyone else noticed. Um, and again, we've, we've had some good uh, interaction with the, uh, the downstream uh, package maintainers. So we've gotten patches from Debian, a pile of them from Red Hat. Um, and so we have a whole bunch of projects that are, that are impending as well. We're working on uh, a PKCS 11 module that I'm hoping is going to end up getting out there in the next month or so. Uh, and Fraunhofer has been working on OpenSSL engine as well. So I think, uh, you know, the, this thing's getting some momentum and it's going to keep going forward, hopefully. And we're going to, going to get all this stuff in place. So, so that, you know, no one else has to go and invent it for themselves. Uh, the command line tools, like I was saying, uh, are, are really, I think, probably one of the most important parts of the project, and it was some of the biggest technical debt that was there. It, it was started out as a almost one-for-one -one clone with a bunch of the, the existing 1.2 commands that, uh, or rather the 1.2 command line tools from, uh, from, from IBM. Um, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you think about the fact that things like taking ownership doesn't really exist anymore. You're setting authorization values for hierarchies, but we had a TPM2 underscore take ownership command for some reason. Um, we don't anymore, thankfully. Uh, and it's really evolved to nearly a one-to-one -one mapping. So we're not building, you know, kind of tools that themselves do more than just one TPM command at this point. Uh, we're taking them and mapping them to individual commands so that you can string them together in a meaningful way to actually uh, uh, do kind of larger tasks. Uh, and so we could, we're just now starting to add policy support so you can make, create a key, bind it to a, a, a set of PCRs using a policy, then you know, using other tools that actually to, to do something meaningful with that key afterwards. And if you, you know, there's not to say that we can't add higher level tools. Uh, if you can't string the existing tools that we have together, uh, happy to have the conversation about which tools we need to add so that we can, when we can actually support the use case. And so downstream, we've had some, some really good adoption as well. Um, I'm uh, currently right now focusing on, on getting some patches together to send upstream to open embedded. Uh, there are a set of, uh, um, or rather there is support in the, the Yucto Linux kernel uh, for TPM uh, device drivers. Unfortunately, it's 
one fragment that turns on all the drivers at once and builds them directly into the kernel. Uh, I'm working on uh, a set of patches to add config frag, or rather, yeah, to, to add kernel config fragments for the, each individual driver so that you could do what you would expect uh, with Yocto and just define a machine feature for your individual machine that will get you the, the driver you need to drive your TPM. Um, I, I'm also probably going to be pushing the envelope a little bit, and I was I was probing the, the Bruce earlier about what it takes to get into OE core because I'm really interested in getting this stuff as far upstream as I can. So the ideal end future would be able to, you know, would be for people to be able to make a meta layer that is a distro layer, turn on a distro feature, and then just get the right TPM uh, stack uh, in their image. Um, RHEL 7.4, actually I don't think that's right, I think it's 7.5, uh, had our 1.0, X releases as the uh, as an officially supported package, which was a big milestone for us, and uh, we're working right now to hit a uh, uh, rel eight for our two dot release. So we've, you know, the the spec has changed a little bit, and we made a couple mistakes in the API along the way. So in our two dot release, which I should be tagging and signing on on Monday, uh, is fixing all that stuff up, and and rel is, is rel eight's coming down really quick. So it's going to be a bit of a nail biter. Um, Red, uh, Red Hat has also been working on integrating the use of the TPM into their Clevis uh, system. I'm not particularly familiar with Clevis, but my understanding is, is that it's kind of a, either uh, like a, an authorization uh, model and uh, or rather a large authorization system. And so we're providing or the, the TPM2 tools and they're wrapping those in shell scripts underneath Clevis to get uh, TPM support there, which is really exciting. There's not a whole lot of uh, very... Uh, high visibility use cases, and this is really one of them. Of course, after OpenXT, who's really been using this for longer than anybody else. Uh, and Suze has, has been working to support uh, our stuff in their next version of SLES. I haven't really heard from them much recently, so I'm just hoping everything's going well. Um, we'll I guess we'll find out when SLES comes out. Uh, this use case is something that's really cropped up new, and these are the first commands I had to deal with because it was kind of half done when I took the project over. Um, Intel worked through the TCG to add a couple new commands to the TPM spec that aren't out in an official uh, spec yet, but they went out in, in a public review draft. Uh, these are called the attached component commands. Uh, and what it allows you to do is to create a key inside of the TPM and then use it somewhere else. So TPM is great for protecting keys, but it's not so great when you want to go and use the keys. They can be very slow. An RSA, uh, you know, a sign operation with a 2K key can be on the order of tens of seconds potentially, key generation could be just as bad. Um, but I guess the, the, the AC commands don't really apply to key generation, so. Uh, but usage, it can be actually quite slow, and the TPM is often referred to as a crypto decelerator. Generally not what we want in a lot of cases. We like it for key management, we don't necessarily like it for key usage. So the attached component commands allow you to create and protect the key using all of these great TPM2 mechanisms, and then uh, using policy you can actually point out that a key can be used in, or rather can be transferred to an attached component, and we can send that key across from the TPM to something that is actually a crypto accelerator uh, and to do operations a lot faster. So the, the reference here is to uh, an Intel product that's called Quick Assist. It's uh, like a, a line speed uh, uh, crypto engine meant to do, uh, you know, uh, I think on the order of like thousands of RSA signatures per second or to do like 10 gigabit uh, network encryption. And so we can do all of the, you know, in, using Intel's PTT, the TPM that's, that runs in the CSME, we can create and protect the keys in there and then transfer them off to the, uh, the attached component uh, where they can get used in a much, much faster mechanism. Now, attached is very loosely defined. All, all it really means is that it's not through the, the, the normal command and response channel. It has to be attached through some other means, which means that, you know, we're, we're, we are responsible for the, the security properties of that, uh, of that mechanism. Um, but I think it, you know, it allows for a lot of interesting things to be done with maybe encrypted disks or you know, other types of accelerators that other people might, might be using. Um, so I think that's actually a really interesting and compelling use case. Uh, but again, and to kind of finish off the, the, the talk about the kind of ecosystem stuff, uh, a healthy open source anything always has more than one option. Uh, and so we are not the only game in town. Google's actually been using 
TPM2 for a long time. They don't implement the TCG standard, but at the time they couldn't have because it didn't exist. Uh, they're also a lot more pragmatic in, in focusing on their individual use cases. So Chrome OS uses the TPM, but it doesn't use a lot of you know, the, the mechanisms that, um, you know, for policy or any things like that. And so they probably made the decision somewhere along the way that PKCS 11 was good enough. And they started out using uh, the, um, uh, the oh, man, I'm not gonna remember the name of it, uh, Open Crypto Key, there we go, uh, to, to use their PKCS or to drive their PKCS, which Open Crypto Key, if you've ever used it, is a bit unstable. And so they've slowly replaced that with what they call CHAPS. Uh, and there's, there's a link at the end of this to, to some of their architecture. Um, it's open source, but it's not really a Google project. So it's not really a, you know open source project and in, in what a lot of us would expect from an open source project. Uh, so you can pick it up and use it, you can build it, um, but I haven't seen it integrated into any distros because it's, it's really specific to the Google use case. Uh, IBM also has a, a competing implementation for, to, for a TPM2 stack. Um, it is not implementing the standard uh, APIs from the TCG, though they, they have a representative that kind of lurks on the, the TCG calls. Um, what it effectively does is it takes our transport mechanism, the system API, and some of the stuff that you would get in ESIS and just kind of stuffs them all together. Um, doesn't have any support for asynchronous operations. And interestingly enough, their API is only three functions. Um, there's over 100 functions from the TPM, so that's a little awkward. Um, it has two of those functions that just create a context and then delete your context. So there's only one function that you use to send a command to the TPM. And one of the parameters to this function determines which command it actually executes. So there's not a whole lot of semantic information there, which also means that that one function prototype has to be able to take any of the parameters from any TPM function. So you're taking C that already has a pretty weak type system, making it even weaker, and then hanging off the end of it are a bunch of var args. Um, so I don't really think that's a, a great API, but you know, make up your own mind. If it's something you like, go ahead and use it. Uh, their stated goal is simplicity, and that's very simple, but I would argue that's probably too simple. Uh, so there's been some other interesting things that came up in the TCG working group, and I don't know if I've got enough time. No one's grabbed the hook out yet, so I'll just keep going. Um, the, the dice spec is actually, I think is pretty cool. The first thing that's awesome about it is that it's the first TCG spec I've ever actually read front to back without falling asleep once in the middle. Uh, it's only 12 pages, which is pretty cool. Um, and it's designed to basically just build identity into a device, right? The TPM can do those things. You can prove the identity of something uh, by virtue of it being a possession of a key. Um, so that's a good way to identify a TPM. Uh, but DICE does this for something very, very small, like microcontroller size. Um, and it takes just a unique secret that's baked into this, this uh, the, whatever is doing the, 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 di the DICE, uh, takes a hash of the first mutable code that the device would be, or the, would be transferring uh, uh, control to, hashes them and sticks them together like it was doing a PCR extend operation. Uh, and so the device, the, the DICE itself becomes the, the root of trust in, in, in that way uh, because updates to it are not necessarily apparent. You can, uh, the updates to the, the first mutable code uh, would be apparent, but not the, the thing doing the hashing itself. Uh, so this means that, you know, the CDI, which is the, I think it's composite device identity uh, that comes out of this would be susceptible to replay. Um, it's not, you know, it's not doing something like attestation where it's including a, uh, um, uh, a nonce into this thing, uh, but it has this interesting property where the first mutable code is, is uh, responsible for protecting the dice, uh, or rather, I'm sorry, the CDI once it's calculated, and it shouldn't be just go handing that out. And so if there is a bug in the, the first mutable code and you patch it, then you get a different CDI. It has a different identity. Um, and so I think that's interesting just from the technical sense, uh, the use case uh, as well, but also I think it's showing a, a real shift in the trends for what we're seeing. You know, the TPM2 is a standalone thing that we stick onto the side of a CPU and, and we put it into a, you know, a, a larger system. This is really uh, what I think is a trend towards getting a lot more granularity in the, the visibility that we have into the, the, the system itself. So getting, uh, uh, being able to establish the identity of individual parts that are being strung together into a whole. And I think, you know, Microsoft is, is uh, was uh, the, the, really the source for the DICE spec. Um, and, and, you know, through the TCG process, it kind of became part of the standard. And I think you're, you're seeing a lot of this stuff coming out in, in some of what Microsoft has been talking about publicly very recently. I think that's incredibly interesting. 
Also the free open source uh, community, you know, we started out with a lot of skepticism about the TPM. I think that really kind of hindered its adoption, uh, but that's been shifting a lot recently. And so I think Purism, the, the Purism uh, project is a, is a good example of that. Um, they've been making laptops for a while now. They've, they've actually started making them and selling them. Uh, I actually uh, got involved with the original Kickstarter. So I have like a Purism Librem Gen 1 laptop still, which is kind of cool. But I wish they were putting TPMs on the back now. I actually emailed uh, um, the, the, the guy who is, I think it's Todd, uh, who is doing this stuff. And he, they were just trying to figure out how to make a laptop in the beginning. So when I was like, hey, you should put a TPM on it, he just kind of said, that's a great idea, maybe someday. Um, and so they started actually offering an optional TPM on their, their platforms fairly recently. And it was cost an extra $100 to get it onto your board. They had the boards. You could you'd place your order, send them an email, and they would say, okay, we'll put a TPM on it for you, and someone would go and solder it on, and it would cost you an extra 100 bucks. The TPM itself cost maybe $2, but you know, it cost a bit of money to get someone to solder it. Um, but suddenly, 98% of their orders were people saying, we want TPMs on our, on our platforms. And so now they just ship them by default with TPMs. Now, if you look at the pictures on the website, I'm not sure if this is actually true, but all of the pictures they have on the website show an older Infineon chip that is still a 1.2 chip. So they might have, they may be shipping 2.0, but from everything I can find, they're still shipping 1.2, so. It is 1.2, it is firmware updatable to 2.0. There you go. Um, but it's because the software stack. Do they, do they have all of the, the bits for doing the updating? I know cha changing the, the firmware in a TPM is non-trivial, do they? Do they make that even possible? Yeah, just got some practice at uh, doing firmware updates. <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, so that's good. So comes as a 1.2. It's on you to make it a 2.0. Uh, so if you do, take our software stack and use it. Um, yeah, and uh, Microsoft actually just released very silently, very quietly, but they released the reference implementation uh, that you know, has been this, the, the code that's been printed out in the, in the TPM specs. Um, that's been a really long time coming uh, and I think it's great. I, I, uh, I started, they asked me to, to help them out and see about getting a, a Linux build together for it and I've got a prototype but I, I told them I wasn't gonna create a pull request for it until they created a, a document that describes how people are supposed to contribute to this. It's Microsoft, it's not exactly what you would expect from a, a, an open source project. Uh, they just kind of push out code in you know, kind of large blocks when the, the spec gets updated. But that's because in order for them to take code in some places, the, the, the spec would have to change. And so uh, they were, it took them a little while, but they, they got a contributing uh, file together and it points out which parts, you know, they, that you, if you touch them, you will be changing the spec and therefore you probably shouldn't touch them unless you know there's a problem. Uh, so using that code, you could pretty much build your own TPM. And from what I understand, most TPMs are actually mostly that code anyways. They open sourced it largely because they had to license it to everyone who was building a TPM, including you know, Intel. Um, and so you know, having it out there under a BSD license like they have it now is uh, um, you know, a very good thing. Uh, and, and I think that really kind of contributes to you know, what we would think of as freedoms there. Uh, Stefan Berger has actually been really quietly working on his own implementation of all these things. Uh, and it's now integrated with QMU. Uh, I'm using this to test my open embedded stuff. So you can actually, on OE, use run QMU scripts, uh, pass in the right magic parameters, use his software TPM on the back end, and you get uh, a TPM when you boot up QMU. So it's actually pretty interesting. And I've been using it to test my own stuff. Uh, and Google did similarly like what they did for their, their software stack. They actually have a whole bunch of code out there that can parse through uh, a spec that's been transported into HTML and produce a bunch of code. But again, you just get the code and it's, it's not really an open source project. The code's there in their repositories for, Chrome, uh, for Chromos, um, but you're on your own for stitching it together into something meaningful. And so really, if you're really driven to build your own free and open TPM, grab yourself a piece of hardware, put this code on there and have at it. And if you do, like, let me know. I think that's pretty interesting. I think it'd be really useful. So that should be it. Um, take any kind of questions you, you've got. Uh, and uh, I know the, the text is pretty bad. These shall be clickable links uh, you know, when the, the, uh, the, the, the slides get published, so. You're attached to the control? Component, yes. Component. Um, doesn't that kind of violate the show location property? 
Again, uh, it's not on by default, so if you make a key, you can't transfer it to an attached component. You have to set up a policy that says it's okay. Uh, and if you say it's okay, you're transferring it out of a shielded location to some other attached component. Fair enough. Oh, sorry, hand goes up right as I'm about to say we're done. The spec uh, waved the hands about what the attached component means, but can you give any implementations you've heard about for how those can be done? Yeah, so the question was about implementations for the attached component. Uh, so actually, right here, the, the second uh, item there, Intel's Quick Assist uh, Crypto Accelerator. We, on, uh, I'm not sure which platform it is, uh, but the Intel's PTT has been hooked up to the uh, to, to Intel's Quick Assist technology, and you can actually, you know, it's a white paper describing, you know, the use case. Is the Quick Assist technology like an added? In this case specifically, it has to be uh, directly on the platform. You can't, we don't send this stuff over like PCI Express or anything. I think it's in the PCH, but I'm not a hardware guy. I'm just repeating what I've heard there. So it's probably in the white paper. Um, <laughs> All right, well, thanks.